Welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. I'm Indre Viscontis, your host and moderator for today's event. The Sound Health Network is led by co-directors Julene Johnson and Charles Lim, who also composed our introductory music. And music therapist Sherry Robb and I round out the leadership team. Our mission is to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and wellness. The Sound Health Network is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts with the University of California, San Francisco, in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming. This webinar series features interdisciplinary conversations between researchers and other stakeholders in our community, representing diverse perspectives and addressing obstacles that stand in the way of our mission. This week, we're gonna discuss how music might be useful for people with developmental differences, like those who are autistic or have Williams syndrome. I'll be moderating a conversation between researcher Miriam Lenz and conductor and autism self-advocate Lynn Bingham. Dr. Miriam Lenz is a clinical scientist and assistant professor in otolaryngology at Vanderbilt. She has research and clinical expertise working with infants, children, and adults with or at risk for developmental disabilities with a particular emphasis on autism spectrum disorder and Williams syndrome. Themes of her current research include how musical engagement might aid in the development of social and emotional well being in diverse populations. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And Dr. Emmelyn Bingham is a full time faculty member at Vanderbilt's Blair School of Music. She's also a conductor with a prolific career as an artistic director and guest conductor of many professional orchestras. And her work during the past few years has included training teachers how to teach kinesthetically via the Dal Crows method, as well as being an advocate for the autism community through public speaking events. And her next step is to bring her knowledge of these unique methodologies combined with her insight and experience as a person with autism to the service of other researchers who might find her expertise useful. I'm sure we will here. Welcome, Lynn. So I'd like to start first off um, uh, asking Miriam to give us an overview of how you came to do this work. Sure, uh, it's great to talk about that. Um, I think like many researchers in the music cognition field, I have a background in music myself. Um, and so I really have had a, I would say a lifelong interest in music and how we learn music and how it affects us. And in particular, um, I used to, I am not a, a, an educator or a teacher on the, on the level of Dr. Bingham, but I used to teach violin lessons back when I was in high school. And I was just so amazed that you could kind of see the wheels turning in kids' heads as they sort of work to figure that out. And um, that made me really interested in sort of child development and child development in music. And then I actually had a, a composition teacher who would teach us ways to compose music without knowing any theory at all and really made it very accessible. And to me, that really highlighted the kind of universality and accessibility of music as this form of engagement and, and form of communication. So then when I began my, my clinical training, I'm a, um, a clinical scientist, like you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I was just always really struck when I worked with children and families, um, families with children with diverse developmental conditions, how often music sort of organically came up in regards to something their child enjoyed, something that was a sort of vehicle for social bonding that they used with their child, something that was important for emotional regulation for the child or the parent. Um, and so that made me really interested in wanting to kind of explore this question more and understand and in different populations, how are people using music, learning from music, impacted by music, and, and how can we harness music for, for therapeutic purposes? Great, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what that work has, has brought for us. Um, but first I wanna ask Lynn to tell us a little bit about your early experiences with music. 
Well, thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you for um, inviting me to be here today. This is a really wonderful uh, opportunity to um, have a great conversation. Um, I uh, had very early exposure to music through one source, which was my mother, who was an, an amateur pianist. And um, I don't remember a time before I remember hearing her play. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that um, once she started to practice or started to play, that all of a sudden my world started to make sense. And so, um, um, although I was undiagnosed at that time because the, the diagnosis didn't exist at that particular time, um, I was always sort of known as the peculiar and child and sometimes nonverbal child. Um, but I remember that all of a sudden things just started to make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I remembered feeling um, that it was my only way that I knew how to really be in the world. And I felt this incredible connection um, with um, images, I have. I later learned I have synesthesia, and I associate pitch with colors. Um, and I also have. Um, uh, but I remember just feeling this sense in my body, and this wanting to move all the time, and feeling that connection between those two things. So that really started my interest in, I believe, in those early years of combining gesture and movement, and the sensations I have. And I should also add another sort of uh, caveat to my. Um, synesthesia is I also hear or sense pitches in different places in my body. So it's just a very embodied perception and experience of music. And I use that in my training as a conductor and also later as a teacher and a professor to, to make things all sort of come together. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine a sort of better skill for a conductor <laughs> than to have this multi-sensory and physical experience of sound. Um, you know, so, you know, I want to talk in a, in a few minutes about that a little bit more, but, but I, I, um, you know, I mentioned in my introduction of you about, about this Dal Crows method. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about sort of why you think that might be an effective tool in, in some of the early, like, you know, like what, or what is Dal Crows kind of, why did you gravitate towards Dal Crows? Um, I, I came to Dow Crows because I was a point in my career at which I just felt kind of like a typical old jaded orchestral musician and I wanted to open my horizons and I had heard about this wonderful um, teacher of musicianship at Juilliard named Robert Abramson who was a Dow Crows um, teacher. I'd like to say master, like Jedi master, but he's a, he was an incredible, incredible person and I learned to reconnect my ears with my body and the joy that I had experienced as a young child returned. Um, and it was just such an incredible experience that I, I wanted to know why, you know, those things, why the connection was so strong and why the connection to how I felt about music and loved it was so strong. So um, I ended up studying with him and learning much more about the method. But the idea is, um, and Dalcrose was, um, is my piano work? I don't know if I did it. Anyhow, but Dalcrose was very in tune with the type of students that he had. He noticed that some uh, played with a great deal of difficulty, like every note was just, you know, felt like it was labored to come to, you know, into their fingers. Some group of students played everything, all the right notes at the right time, but without any expression. And then some students played extremely expressively and in, in the right notes in the right time and so forth. And so he built a whole set of games based on movement and music to sort of address these two, two things and to try to get people to, uh, these musicians to embrace and be more aware of their bodies and their movements in a musical sense. And so you're in essence really listening with your body, which mm -hmm. makes no sense unless you are a musician, but you actually learn to listen with your body and think with your body in a musical way. Great. Yeah, I, uh, I have a seven year old son. And when he was five, um, we started with Del Crows. And it, I had I hadn't I had sort of grown up with Worf and some of these other methods, which are similar, but slightly different. And I, I was just I really remarked at how like the first thing they did was embody the rhythm with their body. And uh, that's something I think when you learn later on, it can be really difficult to do. <laughs> um, and and then we get into all these habits of like, you know, conducting with uh, our body parts, which actually can come in, you know, can, can make it more difficult to perform as a musician. But if you have it sort of right that like, in, it's kind of internally, then that seems like a really great foundation. It, it is really wonderful and necessary, I think. And, and I should also add that Dalcros was initially designed to teach adults, 
but mm. it has been, um, now it's sort of applied for many years with children. And, it, and so it's uh, musicians of all ages and all statures and all levels of development. It's really wonderful. So Miriam, tell us a little bit about um, your work specifically with, uh, with autistic people and autistic children. Um, give us a, a scope of what it is that you do. Yeah, and before I jump into that, I just to, um, going on the theme of what you both were just talking about, uh, Lynn, I loved your comment about sort of reconnecting with how you felt when you were a child with it, because that movement and music connection is so intense in young children often. And, and I do a lot of work with young children. Um, and, you know, you can't, you, you can't tell them not to move, right? Like we can't, I can't tell a two-year-old I'm working with like, oh, I'd really just like you to stay still because I'm going to put this EEG cap on you. And I want to see what your, how your brain's responding to music, but I don't want to get any motion artifact. You can't do that. Like they hear the music and, and, and they're going, they, they hear that. And we, we know that rhythm perception, for example, beat perception in music involves the motor system, but inherently listening to music does have these, these motor components. So, um, I just love your sort of phenomenological experience of, of what that's what that's like and how how rich that makes that experience. So speaking, I guess, of little kids. So we do a lot of work with little kids in our in our lab. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we're we're very focused on um, sort of music and social and emotional engagement, and we have research that's sort of more mechanistic research. So trying to see what's going on, how are we processing music, um, how are our brains perceiving music, what's sort of happening that enables music to maybe have some other effects. Um, and then we have very applied work where we're doing um, intervention studies or community-based studies where we're sort of providing musical experiences and, and seeing what's the impact of them. Um, so sometimes I say we, uh, we like to think about social interaction in general as a very musical and rhythmic type of activity as it is. And our lab kind of goes along the continuum of sort of looking at the music and rhythm of everyday social interaction all the way through looking at specifically social musical interactions when you make music with someone, um, what are the impacts of that? Um, so in terms of um, some of our, our work with young children, one of the things that we're very interested in is this bridging these sort of musicality of um, social interaction and social musical experiences. And it's a really great area to study in young kids because naturally the way we interact with kids um, is very musical. So if people, you can just sort of embody yourself talking to a young child or maybe singing to a young child because that's often what we do with little kids. And you'll find that you likely become very rhythmic. You probably gonna be moving in rhythmic ways. And so we really wanted to say, okay, what is going on that helps children to be sensitive to rhythm in social interaction? And can we use these types of infant directed speech, infant directed singing, these highly musical ways we interact with kids um, as a way in to try to understand or support people in their social engagement? Um, and so that's a real focus in our work with um, children on the autism spectrum as uh, well as looking at you know, uh, children who are otherwise neurotypical, looking at when children engage with someone, uh, speaking to them in a very sort of musical way or specifically singing to them, how does the rhythm and the cueing that happens in that social signal impact children's attention um, and engagement? And what is driving that attention and engagement? So for example, one thing we see is that based on the rhythm of singing, um, you will modulate what you look at. So you'll actually look at the singer's eyes more at specific times. Um, and we know that eye contact is a really important part of social engagement. So can we understand why that is, why being sensitive to rhythm may help you time when and why you're looking um, at the eyes of someone who's singing at you and participating in this um, social engagement uh, exchange. So that that's sort of a a mechanistic way that we we look at music um, and then in some of our applied work we'll say well what happens can we use musical activities to support children in their social interactions or social interaction is a uh, bi-directional it requires two people to have a social interaction can we use it to support their interaction partner often we're working with parents can we use it to help parents interact with their with their children so we've designed some music-based um, parenting strategies. We, we kind of call it like a, a toolbox, a, a, music, a musical toolbox of ways parents can use music to support their, um, their engagement and their interactions with their children. 
feel like I'm so, talking a lot. So that yeah, no. Me. So yeah, I mean, there, there's so much richness in what you just said. And I feel like I, you know, I kind of want to um, drill down into a couple of the themes that you've mentioned. Um, but one, I guess, is like, you know, can you give us a sense of what we know? Specifically, let's let's talk about, you know, kids who are on the autism spectrum. Um, you know, what, let's, setting aside the stereotypes, like what, what, what do we know about how they, in, you know, how, how music affects them, you know, and how that might relate to their social interactions? Yeah, so I can give the sort of general research perspective. And, you know, in that, in that sense, right, we're going to talk about kind of generalities. And I'm sure mm -hmm. everyone's familiar with the, you know, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So this is obviously not going to speak to any individual person's experience. Um, in general, we uh, will often see that there are areas of music processing that may be sort of relative strengths for um, people on the autism spectrum. So, for example, uh, pitch processing, we know that individuals um, on the autism spectrum have a higher prevalence of absolute pitch. So absolute pitch is, is very, very rare. Um, I certainly do not have it, um, but uh, autistic people have a higher likelihood of having um, um, absolute pitch. We also know um, that in a lot of other sort of melodic and actual rhythmic tasks, like um, the types of tasks you might have somebody do in the lab where you might play two different melodies and ask if they're, they sound the same or if you've changed notes or two different rhythms. Um, on many of those types of tasks, um, autistic individuals perform uh, similarly to uh, age matched peers. So we see that on many tasks, these types of musical skills um, can, can be relative strengths. We often, we also, uh, there are many studies that suggest Emotion recognition um, in music uh, is also something that people will be sensitive to. And there's been some uh, less than you would have thought, to be honest. There's been some studies looking at, for example, neuroimaging in um, autistic individuals when people listen to music. Um, and so there's sort of more and more kind of uh, neuroscientific data to kind of back up these findings. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a less developed field than I think you might think based on hmm. the amount of interest that there there is in this topic. Um, but then we also see some areas where there may be some more difficulties. So for example, in the area of sensory motor synchronization, so tapping along to a beat. Um, and then if you change that uh, tempo or pacing and you need to kind of recover and adapt to it, um, that's something where uh, the research suggests that individuals um, on the autism spectrum have more difficulty than age map peers in adapting when you have these sort of fluctuating um, tasks. So I think like everything, there's areas, um, there's areas of relative strengths, there are absolute strengths, there's areas where there may be some different challenges. And I think that's really a, an area where the field is kind of to dig into and say, does performance on any of these musical tasks relate to performances on non-musical, broader social communication, emotional um, skills. Yeah, I mean, it kind of brings me to, to, to wonder, you know, I, I think, you know, finally after decades of um, enlightenment and, and work, we're starting as a society to no longer think of autism as something that needs fixing, but rather accommodation, um, which I think is a very different way of looking at it. And I, I wonder like, if you can give us get a sense of the ways in which your work might help us understand what kinds of accommodations might be helpful um, without this approach of, you know, we're trying to fix something that is broken because it's not, it's just different. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a couple of different directions. So one area is that, um, there's a kind of a couple of different ways we you know you can take that. So one is that whenever we can play to somebody's strengths and interests, um, you're in a better position to be starting from a sort of therapeutic perspective or from an intervention perspective. Um, sometimes I, I like to say, well, as a musician, you would know, right? Like to get better, you have to practice. Um, it turns out that kind of holds for every every skill um, that we're working on. Uh, it's really really kind of a shame. It, Wish there was a quick fix. Um, so if we can do something that is going to put something in somebody's area of interest and help them develop a, a skill and something that they're motivated to, to be working on, that's one area where 
were working in a musical domain, you know, can be helpful. Um, additionally, you know, sort of we always like to think like meeting somebody where they're at. So for example, I, I'm going to talk about the younger end of the age spectrum, but so like I said, I do a lot of work with, with little children. Um, children like songs for the most part, they like musical games, it's fun. It's a very sort of natural form of, of social play. And so if you're working with a child and you wanna be expanding their range of um, play scenarios and expanding the types of play scenarios and help them develop a, a, a more diverse you know, types of play and skill set. If you can do that in something that's going to give them structure, um, is going to be predictable, is going to be um, reinforcing, is going to be fun, uh, is going to help modulate their emotions because we all learn best when we're in a sort of an appropriate level of emotion. Um, music and song games can be a really great way to target that. So it's it's meeting somebody where they're at and doing things that are fun and, and meaningful, but also helping them to continue to kind of, you know, develop and, and build skills in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of, especially with, with young kids, there's a lot of ways we'll use music or help parents use music to um, help build in those types of routines that are, like you're saying, you could think of it as an, as an accommodation, but you could also think about it as being, you know, being resourceful and, and just making things go as smoothly for all people who are, who are, you know, involved um, in that interaction. Yeah, maybe in this case, enrichment is a better term for it than accommodation. Um, so Lynn, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a conductor for you and how you might use, um, you know, some of the, or as you were, you were, you were, talking about and I think in our in our newsletter we profiled I think the word that we used was phono mimetic gesture tell us a little bit about that and how it relates to your conducting that's great you know there are so many different kinds of gesture in the world I mean we we use gesture to signal some side of some kind of signal to someone like we say hello or you know one of these type of things you know so we do this a lot but have meetings um, we do some kinds of gestures that really don't have any specific meaning. Sometimes when we talk, we just move our hands. Sometimes we even do that while we're on the telephone. So we know there's no objective for the other person to know what we're doing, but it just sort of happens. And most of these types of gestures, um, most of the literature says that people with autism don't do very well at understanding those types of gestures. Mm. Phonomimetic gesture is a little bit different. Um, it's a combination of two Greek words, phono meaning sound, and mimetic or mime, which is to imitate. And phonomimetic gestures are gestures that look like sounds sound. Hmm. So, so if you might think about the word, we all learned the word in middle school, the on, onomatopoeia, right? So <laughs> words that sound like, like life events, right? And the same type of thing, it's, it's gesture that looks like sounds sound. Um, and so this is what good effective conductors will use this type of gesture to elicit the kinds of sounds that they want the musicians to play. Not the notes that they're going to play, but the kinds of sounds, the colors that we want to mold, the different colors that we want, different instruments to produce, um, different volume levels and qualities of articulations and those kind of things. We use gesture in that way. Um, and so, um, and that's always just fascinated me. You know, I spent a lot of time sitting in the back. I play the bass. And, um, and you sit and you, and you play the bass in an orchestra. There's a lot of how we say downtime where you're just kind of killing some time. And I remember just really watching the conductor thinking, how does that happen? How does this, this relationship, this communication really happen? And I really started thinking about that on a much deeper level when working with, with Bob Abramson because I watched him use that same kind of gestural practice with very young children. So I really started wondering about many things, but one was obviously, you know, the mechanisms involved in that. And also if there might be perceptual differences in different, um, different types of people, different people with different um, uh, developmental differences or others, and to see if that's sort of a more, more of a universal type of language. Um, and so the interesting thing is that there are many qualities of gestures that also have a musical equivalent to them. Things like duration and energy and, and balance and those types of things. And so I had this really interesting idea and I worked with another colleague at Vanderbilt, <clears throat> Dr. Isu Erdemer. Um, and so we, what we did is we <clears throat> took 
there were um, eight gestures that were um, sort of uh, put into a lexicon uh, by um, a man named Rudolf Laban. And Laban was a contemporary of Jacques Dacros. <clears throat> and he was, uh, interestingly enough, he was uh, the son of a military officer. And he didn't, because he had to move around all the time, he didn't have the opportunity to make a lot of friends. And he was just fascinated with human movement. So he categorized all of human movement in everyday life activities into eight different types of gesture. And so what we did is we took four of them and we made video recordings of me performing these gestures. And we just had random people just say a nonsense syllable. In this case, the syllable was da. And we asked them to say da in the way that they felt that matched the gestures, right? Mm -hmm. So we made these video recordings, we recorded the participants, and then we randomized them and blinded all of the results. And we played them back for our expert panel of reviewers. And we could tell between 82 and 96% of the time, which one of the gestures the participant was watching at the time that they spoke the syllable da. So it's one of these things where, you know, I believe art imitates life. And in, in the same way, you know, cognition is really about how we move in and through the world. And mm -hmm. we take those same things and apply it through this sort of unique cross modal experience, we sort of get this unique communication. Well, and then I began to wonder, I had done some of this work with students with autism before, and they seem to really not only do it pretty well, they also seem to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so the next study that we did, um, I just tested uh, neurotypical kids and kids with autism and compared the results. <clears throat> and they were very similar. There are no statistical differences between the two of them. Um, or sorry, statistically significant differences between the two of them. And then um, I thought, well, what if, what if we have them perform the gestures themselves? Will it strengthen in any way these cross-modal correspondences between this vocomotor system and the visual system? And um, interestingly enough, um, it really helped the, the uh, participants with autism. And by having them actually activate those same gestures, those same process, same motor processes as well, it strengthened those connections. So it's just, it's a really fascinating thing. But the, again, those qualities, oh, the other thing that we did was really interesting too, is we um, went into one of the engineering labs at Vanderbilt and there is a Velcro suit that you can wear, which is really kind of cool. And I was hoping there was like a Velcro wall I could jump up against, but maybe not something <laughs> in that particular space. But what we did is put these little reflective markers on different joints of my body. And we had a motion capture system, which is eight fancy cameras that are um, powered by a souped up Xbox video gaming system. And we created um, 3D point light display renderings of the gestures. And then we compared the qualities, the motor motion qualities of the gestures with the acoustical properties of the sounds. And we found relationships between the movements between um, uh, pitch and duration and the sort of the articulation or energy profile of them and even the timbre of those, those, um, those gestures. So there are things we perceive somehow these gestures in a way, in a systematic way that make mm -hmm. musical sense to us. And the good thing about this, well, I will add is that, you know, I believe the more I, I'm, that I live as a musician in my life, I, the more I believe that we are all musical beings. It's just that the mode is different. And for some young children, they can make as most beautiful music with a tennis ball as someone who's been studying violin for 20 years. Hmm. So it's about bringing in the musician that's in each of us because music is found in every culture in every corner of the world. And so we are, this is something, it's a behavior that we all practice. Our Western minds think of it as an object, you know, my music, my CD, you know, and we buy it, we buy the thing, but it's really a behavior mm -hmm. that we're trying to elicit and to withdraw, to, to draw out of people and to use it in social ways like what Miriam does with families. Yeah, so this reminds me of a, one of my favorite studies was one, I think it was by Laurel Trainer um, and, and their lab um, on kids who went, uh, infants, they were like six months to a year, they did six months of participatory music classes, and they ended up um, having more communicative gestures 
um, at the end of this intervention. And it, it kind of made me think of music as a kind of super stimulus, you know, it kind of helps, it, it, it sort of signposts emotion in a way and an, and an additional sense. Um, and so as you were talking, I was wondering, you know, if, if you have any sense of for, so I, you know, understanding that autism is a spectrum, that there's, you know, people have different strengths and weaknesses and, and, and differences, but is there, I mean, do you, do you have a sense that, um, you know, some kids with autism might benefit from adding music to gestural communication, like the sound component, because it's a super stimulus, or do you think that it's something else or, you know, like what, do you, how do you, what do you, what do you think of it? If this is helpful for people who have uh, challenges understanding gestural communication, how do you think it helps? Is it because it adds more information or different information or what do you think? I think the first thing we want to do is sort of revisit the idea of spectrum because they, we talk about the autism spectrum disorder, but a, a spectrum generally has, I think if you look it up in the dictionary, it talks about there's two defining endpoints. And, but those endpoints have never been defined. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean when someone is on the spectrum? And what does it mean where they are? And I, I don't think of autism as a two-dimensional two model. I think of it as a three-dimensional model and more like a constellation and a constellation of features that some of them may be things that, you know, we that do really well and things that are particular challenges. And so it's more of this like dynamic 3D model rather than this, you know, black to white, you know, put a pin in it right there, right? Mm -hmm. so I think we have to define what those things are. And I think how it does help is to help everyone, regardless of their um, neurodiversity or uh, uh, entrance point or wherever they are in that, 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 um, that galaxy or that constellation, is to find kind of like what Miriam was saying is where they are. And, you know, and help develop that musical side of them. It's a behavior that's inherent in everyone. We find it, we cultivate it, even if the most sophisticated thing that they can use is a tennis ball, you can make music with a tennis ball or mm -hmm. two of them. And if you can use that in, in a way that you can also make music jointly with another person, that might be yet one more way, mode of communication to use music in that way. But I think it's more about finding what is inherently musical in each person, what they like, what, you know, what they're drawn to and, and helping to develop that wherever that is and wherever it takes them. You know, mm -hmm. some people, it takes them into a career some people it doesn't, they, they might, may just love it and they may listen to the radio or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, someone recently described instead of using spectrum, they said color wheel, which I liked because it doesn't have a beginning or an end. And, you know, but anyway, sorry, Miriam, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say uh, to some of, of Lynn's points, I think, you know, in general, for example, in music cognition research, and then also in sort of music intervention space, uh, there's always that question of like, well, you know, what exactly should we do? Or like, what type of music, you know, should I use? And that individual preference really makes a difference. So obviously, it also matters what your end goal is. Like, there are certainly going to be times where um, tempo is actually really going to matter. And it's probably really not appropriate to use a slow song, or it's really not appropriate to use a fast song. But for example, I mean, tempo is an interesting example, because for example, if you are wanting to modulate a child's emotions or arousal level with music, it doesn't work super well if you just play music at the pace or tempo that you want them to be at. It works much better, like Lynn said, if you meet them where they are um, and have that kind of shared experience with them and then gradually um, change, you know, for example, the tempo over there. So that's, you know, something will help parents to do sometimes is, well, instead of just telling your child to be quiet, um, you know, support your child uh, by sharing this moment with them, and then support them in shaping that to, to something else. Um, so, so I think that idea of kind of meeting people where there are and, and their preferences uh, just sort of matters for, for everybody. 
Um, but I also think there are some aspects of music, and, and I liked your idea of the, the super stimulus, and I, there are certainly contexts where we, I think, do think of music. It's kind of the, the signal is on at full in all of those ways. And I think one place we really see that is with the predictability and the structure that music provides. Um, and so if you're going to, and one thing that's interesting is you can actually have predictability and structure on a kind of number of different levels in music. So we talk about mm -hmm. the hierarchical structure of, of music. Um, so you can kind of lock in at different levels and knowing something about one level will actually also inform other um, sort of temporal levels that you're at. We also have music being predictable and that it, it might be familiar. So a song might be pretty similar whether, um, you know, Lynn's singing it or you're singing it or teacher or with the family, you know, mom or teacher or therapist, right? So that's going to provide a sense of familiarity and give a, give a, give a context. Um, but we know that um, when you do things in more predictable ways, that that really is very supportive for uh, for children and for individuals. And so because of the temporal structure of music, it helps people predict when something's going to happen and also what's going to happen because music, is, I mean, obviously you could have crazy 20th century music and be all, all over the place, but that's not typically what we're using. Um, and so that's going to help you predict when and what. It's also going to help you prepare your own response. Um, so that is one reason why it, it may be very helpful for um, supporting these types of, of communication and social interactions. So um, we've disabled the chat in this webinar, but you can put questions into the Q&A uh, portion at the bottom of your screen. You should see uh, two little bubbles that say Q&A. So we have a couple questions. Um, so feel free to, to, to put those in. So um, just apropos of what we, you were just talking about, Miriam, um, Helen Turi asks if you can explain the hierarchical structure of music, um, what you mean by that. I can, as long as Lynn's not going to grade my music theory. Um, <laughs> not today. <laughs> uh, so in this way, when I was talking about sort of the hierarchical structure of music, you can think about we have, uh, well, you have notes, but they're embedded in a, in a specific kind of rhythmic structure. So they're going to be, uh, music has a, a metric structure to it. So for example, if you have a rhythmic pattern, it's going to be embedded within a, uh, the metric structure, the beat based structure of music. And that's going to be embedded in a sort of a larger metric structure of which beats are getting um, emphasized. Um, and then that's going to go into a phrasal structure. Um, and then, you know, depending on the music, you'll probably have uh, phrases even embedded in phrases, or you might have uh, whole sections of songs that are repeating. So you get this kind of recurrent structure, but it's happening on multiple different temporal levels. This is me drawing uh, different levels of um, I don't know if that's not really a phonomimetic gesture, but it is a, <laughs> an attempt at an explanatory gesture. So if you're a musician, you could think about it as like the eighth notes embedded in the quarters, embedded in the halves, embedded in the holes, embedded in, you know, embedded in the, the um, sort of the different measure, uh, structure of the different measures. Um, and then all that's going into sort of a broader phrase. I don't know if that was clarifying. Maybe Lynn can give a better musical description. I think that was great. Um, but yes, there's a metrical structure, but there's also a harmonic structure too. So yeah. we have pitches that go into chords, that go into keys, that go into key relationships. And so when you, you know, when you, and most of these things, both the metrical side and the pitch size in many cases have expectations and good composers, I shouldn't say good, effective composers often will really play with your sense of expectation. And they def it's like going to the movie and when all of a sudden there's a big plot twist and the whole movie theater goes, woo, right? It's the same kind of thing. Composers will try to do that with your sense of expectation. So there's a lot of things that are happening, you know, in multiple ways that when we kind of break them down into these little smaller pieces of the pyramid might be a little helpful. So this is a question either for Miriam or Lynn. Um, if either of you can answer, it might be an impossible question to answer. But it made me wonder whether you've seen any evidence that, um, you know, uh, autistic kids as a group sort of are, are focused more or respond to or are better able to um, access certain aspects of the hierarchical structure of music than others. So for example, is there, is there any evidence that so rhythm is something that 
you know, they, they gravitate more towards, or is it harmony or is it like the repetition? Is it like, is a strophic song more likely to get to, to, you know, or is, are they, or is there just as much variability as there is in the rest of the human population? I would, you know, there, you can, there are all kinds of different studies that have shown evidence here and there, but I really think, and Miriam, I'd be curious, curious to see what you say too, but um, that it, there's a lot of variability in just what people like and what they respond to. And some people are very, you know, driven by rhythm and some people are very driven by harmonies and so forth. And so there's been a, a lot of, in the literature discussion about, you know, what's a um, sort of a low level function, brain function in, with music and a sort of a higher, more global um, structure in music. But researchers don't always agree on what that is and no one really knows. So I don't know, Miriam, if you have something to add. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other point of those individual differences is to what degree does some isolated aspect, like I have a skill in doing this, you know, yes or no, but then is that something you're, you're using in sort of a broader, like, immersive musical experience? So, um, like, you, so I, like, for example, uh, you know, I gave the example before about higher prevalence of absolute pitch. So we know there's sensitivities, you know, to pitch aspects, but like by and large, most people are not just listening to like recordings of like pure tones, like, you know, isolated by themselves. It's sort of, you're using it in this sort of broader musical experience. Um, this is not with autism from some of the work that we've done with Williams syndrome. I will say that uh, and again, I'm speaking in generalities that uh, music that is faster and music that has a strong beat, a stronger pulse is often um, preferred in some of the work we've done in people with Williams syndrome. Hmm. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, so there's one, you know, I, I host a podcast called Cadence and then our second season, we did an episode where we profiled a person with Williams syndrome and uh, he loved singing and making music and um, Send in the Clowns, which is actually a sad piece of music, was his biggest challenge. Uh, he had such a hard time emoting and, and giving that piece the due that he felt it, it deserved um, when it had this slow pace and this kind of, so that, that's a very interesting you know, thing that you're mentioning. It, it speaks to that same experience. Um, so there are a couple questions about um, cultural differences and how much of what we're talking about is specific to a Western cultural perspective of music. Um, so uh, I guess my, yeah, my question to you, Miriam maybe, is to what extent do you include um, different, uh, different cultural music in, in your studies? And you know, what, what, is this something, are, are your findings, can your findings be generalized to other cultures? Yeah, that's a, a really excellent question. And I apologize for not uh, sort of reflecting on that more concretely. Um, so I think it depends on, on, on the study, of course. Um, so we know that, of course, there's a lot of um, differences in music uh, cross-culturally, but uh, there's also some really interesting similarities. So for example, um, the, the metric structures, we were talking about the sort of beat structures, those can certainly be um, different in different cultures. Sort of the, always the classic example is like the Balkan music using more complex meters, for example. Um, but for example, the presence of a beat is pretty universal um, across all cultures. So that is something that does tend to exist across, you know, all the musics um, surveyed. Um, in the types of the, the studies that we did with music, it really actually just depends again on our research question. So since we're often really interested in, in um, harnessing music and to understand the experience of the people that we are working with, we are often then, yes, we're using Western music. We're using music that they're um, experienced with because that's, you know, we're trying to, to, to look at those questions. Um, but there's certainly some nice studies developmentally that look um, cross-culturally um, in terms of rhythm. I think you can see some of Aaron Hannon's studies. Um, Sam Mayer has a whole lot of studies coming out on um, sort of having a whole diverse corpus of music, including how uh, infants sort of physiologically respond to music from cultures that they have or haven't heard. So um, I think there is diversity and we wanna honor and respect that and not have our blinders on. Um, but I also think there's some aspects that we can sort of speak to that are, are likely serving similar ro uh, roles cross-culturally. 
Yeah, that's a good point because I think that, you know, as Lynn has described, music is such a key part of who we are from even before birth, right? Like we know that um, you know, in the, in the end of pregnancy, the fetuses can hear, you know, and so sound has an influence on how their brain is developing. And so it's very hard to um, pull out the cultural exposure um, from sort of what might be quote unquote innate or, or um, cross-cultural. And I, and I think that that's an important part, but also, you know, in some ways, one of the challenges of, of music is that it is very subjective and it is personal taste and your personal taste is in, at least in part um, dependent on what you were exposed to. Um, so, you know, that makes it hard, I think, to study, um, but it also means that it has been more siloed in cultures um, um, in that way, because even just to understand what the expectations should be, um, you have to have had some experience with music to begin with to know where it should go. Like, you know, is it, you know, is it going to resolve or is it going to remain dissonant or, or, or what have you? Um, so there's, I think there's that, I think that that's part of it. Um, Miriam, one of the studies that you um, are currently running that seems to be really interesting too is about um, oftentimes we just see ourselves as um, consumers of music, not producers of music. And as we've talked about, and you know, in Lynn's experience, it's really important part of like, if you really want to grasp the benefits of music, you've got to get up and dance. You've got to be a part of the music making, even if it's just a reaction. Um, and so you have this, uh, uh, this program in which you teach songwriting to, to parents. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. And for those of you that are interested, I'm just gonna um, put up a little bit of information on, uh, on that study too, next to me over here. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. So this is actually a, a study. So as I mentioned, we have programs where we um, uh, work with families, parents and kids, and we teach sort of uh, parents strategies using music to support their child. And um, by and large, everyone signs up for those studies because they, they want something for their child. They want their child to have an experience. They, you know, they're doing everything for their child. And, and that is awesome and wonderful. And I applaud parents and caregivers for doing that. Um, However, another one thing that come, came out from that work, which was uh, not really surprising to us, but a little bit surprising to parents, was parents said, oh, you know what? It was so nice for me to have some time doing music together with other people. You know, that, that really impacted how I was feeling. And wow, it was really nice to, to take an hour and do something. Um, and so it's really important for parents and caregivers to take care of themselves. Um, and I think people know that in general, and perhaps after a year of many people homeschooling during COVID feel that extremely strongly. Um, so we have a program that we teach mindfulness uh, stress reduction strategies through mindful music listening and songwriting. Um, and it's specifically a program for parents of children with developmental disabilities. Um, it's an ongoing study and we're delivering it via telehealth. So it's a virtual study. So people can participate from um, anywhere in, well, anywhere, but anywhere in the US, we wanna get into the, the IRB logistics of it. Um, and we're very happy to have, uh, you know, if anyone's interested, we're happy to uh, share the flyer and, and the information um, to learn about expressing yourself through song. You don't need any music or songwriting experience. You're supported, we work with a wonderful music therapist, Kate Kelly, and um, she would guide you in learning these mindfulness strategies and applying them and using them as you create original songs. And if it's too small over here, uh, we put the link to it in the chat. So um, information is there um, that you can you can look towards. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left, um, and Aaron Culverson has a question, um, and and I, I think this is actually one in which both Lynn and Miriam um, would have a say in, which is you know how can we musicians slash scientists. <laughs> Um, as we have here, better integrate humanistic and scientific inquiries towards continued influence on policymakers. So, you know, oftentimes we have the 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 call for metrics and evaluations to show that these things are effective. But, you know, there's also this humanistic side. So maybe we could start with Lynn. If you could tell us a little bit about, you know, you now are spending some of your time um, advocating and uh, for the autism community. Like, what do you say to um, people, policymakers or stakeholders or, or, or people in power um, about the importance of, of music? 
I think the first thing that needs to happen is we have to sort of reframe our idea of what music is. And I alluded to this a little bit before, but you know, in every other culture, non-Western culture in the world, music is pretty much a grassroots, uh, you know, ground level um, event that is where, where people participate generally um, without any sort of power structures involved whatsoever. People, they, they will, the community will play together. They'll they'll show each other how to play different instruments. There's a very fine line between um, audience and participants. So everybody is generally involved, you know, doing everything uh, on that level. And there's usually a social justice component to that. And if you look at what's you know at what we have in our Western society is pretty much the opposite, where you know music is highly commercial, and we think of it as you know passive music exposure is really kind of our baseline for many things. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've had a parent say to me, "What music should I could I play for my kid to fix my kid?" And it's you know that's it's I mean where do you start with that? It's a very difficult conversation to have. And so I think when we reframe it and realize that it's something that we must all actively participate in first, and to, and that it's not just this byproduct that turns into recordings and turns into concerts and turns into ticket sales and airtime and stream time and that kind of thing. So I think it starts there, and we look at it as a natural be, uh, natural human behavior that we all need to hopefully um, cultivate and in each other and in our communities and in our children um, that well, I think at that point, people will see its value more than just, you know, something that they see advertisements for. Mm -hmm. I also wondered if, um, if, if you, if either of you could talk a little bit about um, how music can, might be a way of connecting with or giving voice to people who are nonverbal, um, particularly those who are autistic, um, because so often they are ignored and forgotten and, you know, not and not included in society. And, and I wondered if, if either of you have any experience or um, ideas on how music might be an effective way of bringing them um, back to the center. It's difficult because music is so cultural and yet culture depends, you know, at least in part on one's ability to socialize and to be able to, to be absolutely working and, and contributing to that culture. Um, and if someone is nonverbal, it makes it extremely difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if we can, help someone find their voice through music and in helping to develop their musical skill and their musical language and their, you know, their voice as it were, to be able to mm -hmm. contribute to that culture. And then they are much less likely to be sort of a byproduct or in, in a more extreme word, a victim of the culture, right? That they're an active participant in the culture. So um, I think it's a huge, 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 um, uh, hugely important thing that we that we need to try to cultivate. And I think, you know, there's a there's a, you use the sort of sort of nonverbal, but I, I think maybe this is also what Lynn was getting at a, a bit. There's many ways to communicate. And we I mean, we're we're sitting here on a web chat and we're using speech and language and, and some gestures. Um, thanks to Lynn's wonderful talk, I'm now hyper aware um, of all the gestures and when I'm using them or not. And, uh, but so there can be many, you know, many ways to, to communicate. And that's certainly something that having those sort of all options on the table um, to best support an individual is something we want to do. Music may be a part of it for some people um, in terms of certain types of communication, or it may be a part of it in terms of, um, you know, facilitating a social experience um, and having some sort of kind of engagement together. Um, you know, it may or may not be a specific referential communication. It might be an emotional communication. It, it might work in different ways. I had a, this is just a total anecdote, but since Lynn had mentioned a Jedi master before, I had once worked with a, a child, uh, a boy uh, a, with autism with very limited verbal skills. Um, but you always knew how he was feeling because he would hum either Imperial Death March or um, uh, the Jedi theme. Um, and so it was a, a nice clue in into what was going on for him that day um, because he was a big Star Wars fan. So, you know, it was a way of communicating um, his emotional state in a different way. So I just give that as, a, as an example, but 
music may be, you know, part of our tool package for, for those types of communicate, for different types of communication. So there's also pre-verbal and um, Bronx Barbara is asking about research on music and the newborn. She's a labor and delivery nurse and she has found that newborns seem to focus and quiet down when she sings a few notes right after delivery, um, which, which sounds like she's a remarkable nurse to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, Miriam, do you know about any work that's being done um, in newborns? Um, so I can speak a little bit about newborns. I do not know of anything that has been done um, really within minutes of delivery. So I would, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing and what that, in, what, I leave the delivery part to you. I'd love to learn more about the music and singing part to be very clear in my own communication um, about that. Uh, but we do know, uh, sort of like you were mentioning before, I mean, the fetus is, uh, is responsive to the auditory environment, particularly in that third trimester. So they're taking in, um, they're sensitive to, to the auditory stimuli around them. And voice, uh, human voice, female voice in particular is an extremely salient um, stimulus, very important for survival that uh, uh, someone be attuned to that. Um, so I think that could be a, um, a part of it in regards to it being um, a voice. When you're singing, I, I don't know how you're singing, but um, we know that infants often like higher sounds. They like these certain sort of aspects of the sounds that happen when we sing without thinking about it. So kind of going to the idea of that super stimulus. Um, we, when you sing, you tend to do these things that make yourself a super stimulus without even uh, thinking that you're, you're doing that in terms of a specific pitch pattern that you might be doing, the level of the pitch and the rhythmicity of it. Um, you may be elongating your vocal track, which is gonna make it a higher and kind of a more loving sound. It's the technical term we'll sometimes use for, for timbre, as Lynn describes, but a loving timbre. Um, and so all of those things would be salient um, you know, to an infant and calming and alerting is a way that, you know, infants um, alert to something or, or kind of attune to something. Again, I don't know anything that's been done in the first couple of minutes after birth, so I would, I'd love to learn more. Um, but later on in the newborn period, in those first weeks and months, we certainly know that. Well, it sounds like there's some ripe areas of research. Um, so I want to thank Miriam and Lynn for uh, participating in our webinar today, and thank you to all of you. Um, if you want to learn more or you want to take a deep dive into one of the papers from Dr. Lenz's lab, join us next week at noon uh, Pacific time or 3 p.m. Eastern, June 2nd, for an in-depth discussion of a paper on beat tracking in people with Williams syndrome led by author Anna Kosden, who will be joined uh, by music therapist Edward Roth, uh, who's gonna be moderating the conversation during our monthly journal club. Um, our project manager, Stephanie, has put uh, some information into the chat to register. So you can learn also more about the Sound Health Network and take advantage of the resources we offer if you visit our website, soundhealth.ucsf.edu. Um, and you can engage with us through our social media accounts at SoundHealthNet on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can watch archived video content, including previous webinars and this webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you both very much. And we will see everyone else next month.